biggest opportunity in my life. Okay, I have a question. And it's kind of touching on what Ron was saying. But is there a difference if you're called in just to be a witness or if you're actually being indicted? Is there a difference when you're in front of the grand jury as far as... Okay, we were called in as witnesses. We weren't called in on our own behalf. As defendants. As defendants. So is there a difference if you're a witness or if you're a defendant you know, as far you... as how it's conducted? I mean, as far as the prosecutor asking us questions and us okay. answering the questions or... Either one can, can uh, claim the fifth or you can answer the questions. And you demand that he sat down and not ask her the question if she's just brought in as a witness. It's my understanding that the grand jury is the ones that are conducting the, the interview. That's, That's not the supposed to be the yeah. prosecutor. The prosecutor made it quite clear it was his job to ask the questions. The grand jury was just there to make a decision on whatever right. they were going to make their decision on. But we did take the fifth, and then, of course, we were hauled in in front of the judge to either go to jail or get a lawyer. So those were the only two options at that point. Turn over the books. Or, or turn over. Turn over the books or you be in contempt to go to jail. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. So it, my question is, is there a difference? If we are called in as a witness to answer their questions, or if we're called in as a defendant, where we can draw the line? You have the ability to draw the line, I think, in, in any situation, whether you're a witness or a defendant. So our question because, should have been directed to the grand jury, because I do know that it was grand jury's decision to send us to the courts, because we wouldn't do what they wanted us to do. So it was up to them, the grand jury foreman, to make that decision. Not you have to prosecute. understand that the grand jury is not is not a pack of, of legal geniuses or law oh. professors. Uh, so they can make mistakes about the law. I mean, you might be in front of a grand jury where the entire grand jury believes that you have to pay your fair share. They may also believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Who knows? But uh, if you can come in and present stuff, uh, Supreme Court cases, and whatever else that you relied on to make your decision, I mean, they may change completely, you know? So anyway, the point being is that you have the power. And when the judge says you can do this, it's the green death bill or the blue death bill. You say, no, I'm going to take uh, something else, you know. Um, and, and then Ron spoke up, and, uh, or Desi, was it uh, Susie or, uh, uh, anyway. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, the point is, I, I had this flash, and i got to tell you real quick about this one. Uh, can you say that you have two more minutes for the team? Break time. Take a break and be good. And I wanted to quickly address what she just said in the last minute here. Uh, there was a reason that the attorney turned to the jury in the end and said, do you have any questions? It's called due process of the jury. Okay. So therefore, he had to do that. Everything that happened before that was procedure, which means he could have claimed anything because he made a statement. And he asked the question, hey, what is your authority to ask me questions? Can you please cite your authority? He would have fallen silent. Right. Okay? Okay. Okay. So Martin goes and he uses some of his money for his own personal stuff. Then a woman comes in and she has a large amount of the account. And she wants it all out right now. And there isn't enough. So whatever happened there, she took the complaint to the federal authorities. And Barefoot Sanders, the same one that decided with me on the 
State Department case. Barefoot Sanders was handling the case. And Mark was brought in. And Barefoot Sanders said, you will produce the books and records of your private banking operation. And Martin would not produce them, so Barefoot Sanders put him in civil contempt for 180 days. Okay? At the end of 180 days, he brought Martin back in the, in the courtroom and said, you're going to produce your books and records now? Martin said, no. Another 180 days. <coughs> Brings him back into court again. So you're going to produce your books and records now? No. Another 180 days. Well, how long can this continue? Three times. And so he put him in three times for 180 days. And Martin never gave up his books and records. And you know what the end result of that civil contempt was? That's right. Martin and his girlfriend hooked up and they went to San Antonio with a bottle of champagne. They, and if he had given up his book and books and records, he probably would have gotten a very serious prison term. Now, I'm not saying that I recommend anybody do that. I mean, what Martin did was not right, and the Bible, of course, would call that theft because he basically stole that woman's money. But I'm just explaining it to you so that you understand that civil contempt operation. And if it ever came to it, that you know that one option, that you, have, you could do 180 days, three times in a row, and then it's over. Now, Susie didn't know that at the time. She did a bunch more than that. But that's against the law. And I believe that you got them for, for holding you beyond the legal limit. Well, I couldn't find, uh, in all the research that I did in the code books, I couldn't find any Pacific, like, I take that back, I did find three Pacific uh, time frames. One was 30 days, uh, one was uh, 90 days, I believe, no, six months, and then, right. six months, and then the next one was, um, no, I think that's all it was. It was a, there was just a, a 30 day and a six month time frame that they could hold you. And I brought that up to them. And she just said, I don't care. Put it back. Yeah, well, they can do that, like I said, three times. Three times 180 days. <clears throat> Is there a lot longer now? Okay. When you talked about a criminal uh, contempt, okay, you explained some of the rights that you had due process, witnesses, you know, makes your accuser. Accuser. Does that have to do with the fact that in order to have a criminal complaint, you must have wrong a party? You must have caused damage to a party? Is that, is that related? Could be. Because I know some people have said when a judge says, well, let me ask, is this criminal or civil? And he says criminal. I say, well, who is a party that I've damaged? You ever heard that say something? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Is, is that... Is that the reason that you're entitled to your due process? I'm trying to make the connection. Because well, you're entitled to due process if it's criminal. That's why I said criminal. Yeah. So if, if, if you said, if you asked him, what contempt am I being held on? He said, criminal. And you said, well, who is the injured party? Okay, having them to identify the injured party. Yeah. Okay, like any other criminal act, if you, if you do a criminal act, you've injured someone. Violate a statute, if he can't do that and say, then, then, then why are you confining contempt of a criminal charge? So I, I don't know, I'm just asking a question. I'm trying to draw a correlation. Okay. Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, 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 it's, 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 if it's criminal contempt, you're entitled to everything that would be involved in a crime. So then you, you, after you go to trial, uh, if you get convicted, then comes allocution. And as I mentioned earlier, Robert Ford wrote in his book that everyone who goes to prison is there voluntarily. It's important.
hard not to volunteer. <laughs> so, um, Rule 32 in the federal criminal uh, rules uh, says that the court. You want to? You want to read it? I got it. Huh? You found it? Well, how about going to my phone and read? Section opportunity under opportunity to speak. Um, section A by a party. Before imposing sentence, the court must I provide the, de provide the defendant's attorney an opportunity to speak on the defendant's behalf. Uh, double I or the, the number two. Address the defendant personally in order to permit the defendant to speak or present any information to mitigate the sentence. And three, provide an attorney for the government an opportunity to speak equivalent to that of the defendant's attorney. That's uh, all of subsection A. Do you want me to read subsection B and C? Uh, I don't know what's there. Um, dealing with by a victim, opportunities to be by a victim or in-camera proceedings. Oh, okay, yeah, they can bring in the victims to whine and cry or whatever. Um, but uh, the important part is that you get to speak at your sentencing. Well, a lot of people think that when, it, you know, after the, the trial and the rest of that, and it's sentencing time, they think that the judge just says, well, you get 10 years, and that's it. But it's important to know that they have to ask the question and that you have all the time that you need to answer the question. And um, even if that takes hours. And because if you've got information to mitigate the sentence or uh, a statement to make, you're entitled to do so. And if you can say the right stuff, you can win the case right there. Friends of uh, my son's 
grounds. You've got grounds to sue them. I know, and I'm so scared because of the fact that they always retaliate. And I'm by myself, you know what I mean? Ever since my older son has gotten in trouble, I've been harassed. My younger son has been harassed. And I know, I know, once I start fighting back, I'm going to have to move. I'm going to have to hide somewhere because they're going to be retaliating. And, and you know, they, it always says on the search warrant, single parent or single family dwelling or whatever. They, they know I'm there by myself. And they know that they've continued to get away with it, so they keep doing it. Another thing, they keep taking my property, stealing stuff. And I, I was going to ask, is it best to put a sticker on your computers and stuff that says evidence? Or is it better to put something on it that says um, least two? Which, what's the best thing to put on your stuff to keep them from taking your stuff? 10,000 volts. <laughs> 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 that would be the best idea. <laughs> 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 but, uh, um, you know, I don't know how to answer that one. You probably have to pray about it. And this is, you know, I, some people understand this and some don't. I'm hoping that you do. You can call on our Heavenly Father. And he says in Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and let me show the great way of thing which thou knows not. Exactly. That's his telephone number. Uh, that's his telephone number, exactly. And Jeremiah 33 3, it says, Call unto me, I will answer and show you great and mighty things thou knowest not. Now, who's talking? It's our Heavenly Father. It's, this is his book. He cannot tell a lie, and he has all the power in the universe. Amen. He can whack them like they've never been whacked before. And and you can ask him to do it and and show them their ways. I I uh, just feel it on my heart right now to share with you that in Psalm ninety one uh, Huh? In Psalm ninety one. In the verses. Yeah. Okay. There shall no one who follow the English from the place of my land, for he should give his name no charge of thee to keep thee all thy days. Right. Well, but here's the point I was going to get to about Psalm 91. First off, there have been books written about it. Books written about one psalm, Psalm 91. Now, if you read it almost through the whole thing, oh, I didn't mean to. To run away, Mark. You had a question? Talk to me. <laughs> no. Okay. So, so Psalm ninety-one. The the um, if you read it, seventy-five, eighty percent of it is talk, important talk, but just talk. And then you come towards the end, and it says, "I will." Well, now that's different. <laughs> Because they're not, that's not ordinary talk. When he says, I will, that's getting serious. Okay? So, World War I, it was the 91st Brigade. Chaplain that made out cards with the 91st Psalm on them, handed them off to all the troops, and got a commitment from each and every soldier that they would read the 91st Psalm every day. And, they were in three of the bloodiest battles of World War I. Casualties to their left and to their right on their side of the line were running at 90%. Casualties for the 91st Brigade, zero. Amen, And, you know, in the wreck yard at, at the uh, Cherokee County Jail, I talked to other inmates, and they understood that. And, and they were doing the same thing, calling on our Heavenly Father. And Cherokee County, is, like you say, is so rotten. I mean, other guys have been in the wreck yard said, 
Fox, anybody who bucks the system in this county, uh, they'll, they'll, tie, they'll, they'll handcuff them to a tree and use them for target practice. And I'm still bucking the system. I'm not looking for, for being used for target practice, but I'm calling upon our Heavenly Father for protection. And, you know, your situation, it strikes me as being that kind of a situation. And uh, he can't tell a lie, and he has all the power in the universe. Amen. And there's some things that, you know, uh, some things that are difficult to decide, like what you're talking about, you know, which way do you do? You could do both even, but, uh, um, you know, label things as evidence and be least. Um, There's all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm taking the, the trespassing sign, uh, you know, different things that can be done. But um, the most important one is to call on our Heavenly Father. Amen. Mm -hmm. May I approach your honor? <laughs> 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 this, this guy is so good with his jokes, and he's such a quick wit. Thank you. Um, we would, most of us would not have to take these, let's say, fringe approaches had there been justice in the courts. Right. But it appears that uh, they expose themselves to loopholes that they themselves keep for their own. And if we figure out those loopholes, we may stand a winning chance. Unfortunately, not everybody has the, ch the time and the dedication to perform that which you do and others uh, in the same venue. Um, going back to the point you were making earlier in regards to allocution, you said that in sentencing, you can re-invoke and re the witnesses. And that's a strategic move, and it's a valid one. Mm -hmm. The question I have in this particular is, is <clears throat> do you use a particular, do you no longer put motions into the court? How do you bring the witnesses at time of allocation or at sentencing? Okay, well, you, um, I can send you how I do it. Uh, make a note, make a note, make a note. <laughs> send all the files. <laughs> Those are like hacksaw type files? <laughs> <laughs> But the right here with the right hand this time. <laughs> okay, so you do have an affidavit and you declare that, that you need these witnesses and that their testimony is material and relevant to the case. And, and uh, uh, if you want them to bring certain things, they, uh, if they have them in their possession, they have to bring them. And you write all this stuff up and you give it to the clerks. And the clerks uh, put it on the subpoena documents. The clerks put on the raised seal or printed seal or something. They got some kind of seal that they put on the document. And then in the federal, it goes to the U.S. Marshals for service. In the state, it'll go to the sheriff's department, and they handle the service, and it, there's no provision for them charging you a dime for it. Okay, you you should be able. They should do almost all the work. You just give the order of who and what and when, and and there and there's they should be in lockstep and get it done. Let's say, well, you have to give them enough time. Right, so let's say the sentencing is 30 days. Well, um, you should get your subpoenas in as early as you can. You get the subpoenas from the court? Yes. Well, you, you can, and you could write them up, and then they could put the seal on it and hand it to the U.S. Marshal, or you could create a document and provide them with that information. So in the federal, I think the... In some places, they're, they're, you know, they'll, they'll just give you the subpoenas. You make them up, but you have to pass them back to them. 
and for them to turn it over to the U.S. Marshals. Okay? And, but in the state, it's always been my experience that you can just do it up and, I mean, your list and what they have to bring and so on. And then the clerks type all that in in their own stuff and create the subpoenas and give them to the sheriff to serve. And your experience in the states about what, a couple of weeks? Um, depending on how many you have, they put clerks on it and they try and do it real fast. Uh, most of the time, if it, I can I can get the subpoenas if I have them in there eight or nine o'clock in the morning. By closing time, I've got them. What would you do in the case that uh, an original witness was refused from being brought forth as a witness by the court? Um, well, see, this comes to the power of of your affidavit, and you declare that this witness is material. Gotcha. relevant to your case and has done, you know, uh, notarized in the, under penalty of perjury and, uh, you know, who's going to argue? I mean, they need to have a counter affidavit. they got to have a hell of a good reason why not. And you can email that yeah. affidavit to me so I can email it to everybody else, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I got connections. Well, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I plan on, I made a note here so I send it out to everybody and everybody will have it. I have a question regarding the allocution process also. Is it my understanding that regardless of what argument you come up with, whatever reasoning you give as to why you know this isn't fair, why this, this person lied, this person did this, here's proof that I'm not guilty of whatever crime you're being accused of. At the time of sentencing when the judge says, I'm recommending that you be sentenced for 10 years. If I continue to say I don't accept that sentence, does it matter what I say prior to? Is that just something for the court to see in terms of like we're putting on a play, or is it actually something that needs to be relevant? Okay. Um, they'll, they'll stop you if you start talking about Santa Claus and the man in the moon. It's totally irrelevant, but uh, uh, stuff that's relevant, uh, you are setting the record, even if you're dealing with a judge that's an absolute born idiot, like Judge Bentley that told Dr. Barry Brooks. I don't think the Supreme Court said that. <laughs> and, and so even if you're dealing with an idiot, you're, you're preparing a record that goes forward to the appellate court or, you know, uh, and by the way, a lot of people don't know this one, and this is what we raised in Tim and Dawn stuff. The appellate court has two functions, and appeals is the main one that gets used. The other one is used so infrequently that they may not even understand it when you send it in. But Tim and Don's case, they have not, uh, uh, like prior to any sentencing, we were already sending documents to the appeals court. <coughs> but on the envelope put, on the envelope put that this envelope contains only file stamped court documents and that it was for for the purpose of supervisory authority. See, they have supervisory authority on the courts below them. And this was not an appeal, but this was to show the court, the appeals court, that these guys at the trial court were running outside the legal limit, denying due process, um, you know, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And these were not, the important part about that these are file stamped court documents, that means it's all public record. And we're not dealing with ex parte <coughs> communications, like as in 
This envelope contains no ex parte communications, only court documents that are file stamped. So it's in the public record already. And then the purpose of this thing is to invoke supervisory authority. Is that interesting? Yeah. So you can get, you can be rattling the cage at the appeals court while your trial is still going on. You like that one? Yeah. That's the, the equivalent of an interlocutory appeal. Yeah, well, they'll try and block you on an interlocutory appeal. Right. But interlocutory appeal is another way of doing something similar. From a different angle. From a different angle, yes. Um, I have three questions. Um, in Pennsylvania, for one state, and New Jersey as well, when you have, let's say, for instance, a ticket, they found you guilty, you go to appeal, and when you're appealing, you're actually appealing to the criminal court. Yeah, they are criminals. <laughs> now, for the subpoenas, you said we didn't have to pay anything. In Pennsylvania, they're charging for the, for the subpoenas to send them out. In a criminal case? Um, civil. Oh, well, yeah, in civil, they can charge. Okay. But not in a criminal case. Okay. Now, um, when the judge actually enters the plea for you, let's say you tell him or her, you do not plea. I have seen where they have actually entered the plea for people right. who said they don't plea. If you refuse to enter a plea, they'll be authorized to enter a plea for you. But if you say, I'd love to enter a plea, judge, I really, really want to enter a plea. However, I don't understand. And my good friend Perry Mason didn't show up today and you could plainly see I'm without legal counsel. And that business of being without legal counsel stopped them dead in their tracks every time. Or I shouldn't say every time. Because you can run into a real bonehead sometimes. And um, but they're slaughtered if they proceed when you say I need legal counsel. And they say, no, we're not going to do that. Like like uh, Jerry Buckmeyer did with Don McCarley. When Don McCarley said, I want Robert Fox as my assistant as counsel. He said, no, Fox is not an attorney. You can't have him. You're going to represent yourself pro se. <laughs> and then they lost the case. And Don McCarley walked right out the front door of his sentencing. The uh, statutory authority for that is Federal Rules Rule 11, when it says the um, uh, you have to plead. If you're going to plead, um, there's only one plea under which they have to check that you understand the plea, and that's the guilty plea. If you take the guilty plea, they must make sure that you understand the charges. They cannot move if you do not refuse. Operative word is refuse. So as long as you do not refuse, they cannot move forward. Mm -hmm. We were able to postpone arraignment seven times on that issue. However, it does fade away because at a certain point the judge figured out, oh, okay, they're after the statutory um, uh, legal regulatory, you have to, um, I forget the term right now, uh, no, um, speaking of the trial, uh, speedy, speedy trial, trial. Speedy trial. statutory speedy mm -hmm. trial, and he put a time clock on it and said, look, we are doing this for you, so you can't push this beyond the speedy trial. So you can play it for a while, but eventually <clears throat> they'll do their game. So that's why I call them a little bit of French, French, uh, French solutions to some degree. Um, however, the everything that I've heard thus far, the everything that you have to say with the um, keeping them at their own rules seems to work the most. Where I think Carla was mentioned that if you point out that which they don't do, then you don't have to prove anything because they already didn't do it. 
and by not doing it, still consider it an agency or an officer's action. That which you're supposed to do is still an action as if it was done, the not doing part. And it's just as incriminating upon his actions as if it were an action against you, but you don't have to prove anything because he did not prove by not doing it into the record. And that seems to work with him. That's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> at allocution, uh, some people have been able to defeat the thing because of their procedures or their, their uh, uh, the facts of the case. Um, there's all kinds of stuff on that. But even when you, when everything is against you, um, like my friend Ralph Kergel, and it was a misdemeanor, and, and it was maximum six months and four thousand dollar fine. He told him right up front. He said, "I have no money." So they dropped the four thousand dollar fine, and then they wanted to give him six months. He said, "No, I can't do that." And they said, "Well, how about three? No, no, I can't do that. Two? No, can't do that. One? No. It's a week." Where did he even set up for that? Well, he, he would tell you if he was here right now, you know, or he could call me and patch him in on the phone. His comment was that he probably could have talked him down to zero, but uh, he was, you know... Uh, he didn't want to push his luck. He, he wasn't 100% sure, and he was, like, tired of arguing with them. And so he figured he'd do a week and be out. So that's what he did. A week or a weekend? A week. I think he, think he was there six days and they threw him out. Got out early on good was behavior? This? Huh? Got out early on good behavior? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that civil or criminal? Criminal. Wow. Felony or? No, it was misdemeanor B in Texas. Maximum is six months in jail. And they wanted to give him the six months. But he talked to right down to one week. Simply by not accepting? Yeah, not accepting. He can't accept that. You know? And you can soften it if you want. You can say, Judge, with all due respect, I can't accept that. Uh, you know, and you can give him reasons or not give him reasons. And, you know, their whole system is voluntary. You want to get Judge Work's book, huh? Well, I mean, you could, but it has to be the first edition because after that, it was deleted. Really? Yeah. What if I... But you may be able to find one. You know, they sell reduced books on the internet. The Tempting of America. B O R K. He was born in town. So what? What? If he, what? Presser say he's guilty of a felony. Then it comes down to amputation. And he just got permission to blow back there. Microphone. Microphone. But if he gets to the point of allocution, allocution, and he says that I'm not guilty, and he just stops at that, and he says it's going to ten years, can he just say I don't accept? It? Yeah, that's what I would do. I would just say I don't accept it, and you know, like with all due respect, I don't accept it. Um, of course, myself, I wouldn't go looking to do a crime in the first place. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean much to them. I mean, they're, they have a revenue enhancement program like Blackbeard the Pirate. <laughs> you know, what is the name of the book again? The Tempting of America by Robert Bork. And another one that you need to get is Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. Yeah, that's a good one. And of 
course, you need to, where'd my U.S. government manual get to? Right here. I don't know. I've never even seen it. Well, and it was passed, being passed around for everyone to see that I was Yeah, everybody saw it. Except <laughs> Except <laughs> Gregory. <laughs> did, did he said that everyone saw it. Except you. Except Gregory. Right. <laughs> Amazing. How come it didn't get passed around? It got passed around. We did. It went all the way to the back. Mike was hoarding it. Moving on. Yeah. I have a question. In this allocution, allocution um, when um, the judge is giving a sentence and you're kind of like negotiating or saying, I can't do that. And you get down to a point where, you know, he says, well, what about, you know, two years? And you still say no. And he said, too bad. Okay, go over and sign the papers. When you walk over to sign papers with a clerk and refuse to sign the papers, it doesn't make difference what you just said to sign papers, right? Well, that's another good point. That would be not signing the papers is going to throw a monkey wrench in their gears. And and I haven't covered this point yet, and I need to right now. Okay, so I and I at least I don't think I did. You tell me if I did. When when. When they get me in the jail there, and it's like empty your pockets, okay, five pans of comb, set of keys, uh, you know, such and such cash. They count it all up, they write it all up, and they say, sign here for your property. Tell them, no, I'm not signing. Did I cover that? No. no. Okay, I tell them, no, I'm not signing. So they, the jailer says, well, don't you care about your property? So let me see if I understand this correctly. If I don't sign, that makes you a thief? <laughs> okay, and I don't sign. And they put that property away as secure as they do anybody else. And then when it comes time to leave, they say, they pass me the paper to sign here for your property. So I didn't sign coming in, and I'm not signing going out. They still give me the stuff. Yeah, but you missing? No. Did have one trouble, one time trouble with uh, at Dallas County Jail and because they, I had gold coins and they didn't put them with the property. They put them in a, a vault and they had them, how should we say, more secure. And when I raised the ruckus about the missing gold coins, he said, oh, those are in the vault. In, you know, like, the, the head cheese jailer had a vault, and they had to get him to open it up and get him up. How many of these people are bad? How many are good percentage-wise in your own experience? Um, mostly bad. You know, the... Um, <clears throat> okay, I've got a couple of friends... <clears throat> Uh, Brady Byron worked at the Dallas County Jail for six years. The other guys told him because they, they knew his attitude and he didn't go along with them beating up prisoners and stuff like that. And they just told him, since you don't want to toe the line with the, with the rest of us, uh, you're going to have a Serpico type event. What? A Serpico type event. Do you all know who Serpico was? Yeah. I mean, a true story of a cop that was straight, and the other guy set him up, and, and the drug druggies put a round through his head. Fortunately, he survived. So, um, and he was set up for that. They could have stopped that, but they, his, his partners didn't stop it. They, they put him in line to get set it up to get him killed. And that's what they threatened my friend Brady with at the Dallas County Jail. I have another friend, Lewis Moore, for five years on the New Orleans Police Force. And his comment was, anyone who's there any longer than five years is totally 
really corrupt. <laughs> he said, new guys start, they come in and they have these ideas that, they have these ideas that um, they're going to arrest the bad guys and help the good people and They're going to arrest the bad guys and help the good people and so on and so forth. But they get swallowed up in the corruption. And, uh, you know, once they start taking bribes and stealing drugs and, and all kinds of stuff, it's just down in. Um, but every once in a while you run into a nice story. And uh, I have a friend named Chuck. Was a Marine, a former Marine, and he was at a bar in Richardson. And um, he went out to his car. Now we don't know what he went to his car for. It could have been to get his cell phone or business cards or something, whatever. But as he approaches his car and he's just about right there, he gets slammed from behind, and there are three plain clothes Richardson detectives never said a word and slammed him into the car and he, Chuck doesn't know what's happening. All he knows is that he's being assaulted. He turns around and whacks one of them in the Adam's apple off to the hospital. He kicks the other one in the nuts off to the hospital. Sidekick to the third one breaks his knee off to the hospital. <laughs> and and then uniform cops arrest Chuck for assaulting officers. Okay? Well, at his trial, there were witnesses. The witnesses from the bar, a businesswoman from across the street, and it, it, it was it brought out that the, these detectives never said a word. They never said, we're police. They never said, you're under arrest. They never said, stop. They didn't say anything. They just slammed Chuck against the car. And for all he knew, it was a mugging or an attempt on his life for unknown reasons. And he was trained in the military. And he knew how to defend himself. And they tackled the wrong guy. <laughs> and he chewed them up. And that, and those detectives, by the way, were all fired from the from the police department. Good. One of them said, one of them said to Chuck uh, that they were going to get him. And uh, he said to that guy, he said, at a thousand yards, I can take the tip of your little finger off. And he said, you won't see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> and and so uh, oh and he won a hundred and forty thousand dollars on it too good i hate to admit it but we're going to run out of tapes we didn't come prepared enough for well, you we're good that one. We're is there anything right. oh yeah is <laughs> no, there we got, anything we got on your 40, list that we, we didn't 40, cover 45, 45 minutes focus. on this one left habeas focus have we have we seen <laughs> did we cover everything on your list what can we squeeze any more out of you? Well, it's up to you. What, uh, you you did, want to stay for a few more minutes? Uh, did you, did you, you cover everything? Did you want to talk about habeas corpus for a few minutes? Yeah, sure. right. Yeah, what is habeas corpus exactly? Okay. Uh, habeas corpus, well, it's, there's a part in that stapled, how many pages was it? Was it stapled together? 11 pages? 10 on that one. Huh? 10? Uh, there were originally 11, but you already given one. Okay, 10. There's one in there called, it is William Penn. And that talks about habeas corpus. Mm. Freedom for William Penn.
Anyway, that was a story that can practically bring tears to your eyes. Anyway, um, I did, there was a, there's a, a, a multimillionaire in Dallas, Ken Evans. He uh, had a ruckus with a judge and uh, he sued the judge and uh, her friends who were judges. One of them put Ken Evans in the Dallas County Jail. And um, because Ken Evans is a multimillionaire, uh, he could hire any attorney in the country. Instead of calling an attorney, he called me. And the net result was a unanimous win at the Texas Supreme Court. In the time he was at the Dallas County Jail, he had a sign up on the wall at the door of his cell. And, and uh, it's, it declared that he had been kidnapped and that they were his kidnappers. <laughs> and the jailers laughed at that. But Ken said that the day that this order came down from the Supreme Court of Texas, and that they escorted him out of the jail, he said they were shaking. He said that they were traumatized by this event. What was the story behind that? Uh, he had sued a judge, and to retaliate against him, they put him in the Dallas County Jail. The, and, the, and the stuff be, before that goes like this. He had lakefront property, a beautiful home. Uh, his wife uh, was the one who read all the MR eye scans at Parkland Hospital. She was like even not just a doctor, but the supervisor of other doctors. And Parkland, of course, is where they took Kennedy when he was shot. And um, anyway, between Ken and his wife, they had considerable wealth and lakefront property. Okay, so there's a lawn right to the lake. Okay, and he has grandchildren. Now, in Texas, there's um, uh, things called water moccasins. Little snakes. They are poisonous snakes, and Ken had a concern for the grandchildren that they could be playing in the backyard and not paying attention, and especially with the grass, the snakes blend in, and next thing you know, you're snake bit. So what he, what he did was he built a redwood deck you know, at the back, not covering the whole yard or anything, it was a redwood deck and he wanted to tell the children to limit their playing to the redwood deck. Well, they said, somebody complained or whatever and code enforcement told him he had to tear it up. Even though his neighbor had one like that. But he had to tear up his. And so he took it to court and the judge uh, just basically stomped all over him. He was pissed, so he sued the judge, and the retaliation put Ken in, in the jail. And um, their, their stuff was defective. I took a look at the file, and I saw what I saw, and I knew it was defective. I went to the phone and called a, a businessman that I knew that was not too far away from the courthouse. And I said, would you please come down? I need for you to witness what's in this file. He came on down, I showed him the file, and you know, he took notice of the defect. And then he and I both did affidavits. This is, this is a important piece that I might have missed. Deuteronomy 1915. At the mouth of two or more witnesses, so shall the matter be established. 
So when the police say Mark was speeding, if there's two or more of us, we'll sign affidavits. You know, we were in the car, he was not speeding. Valentine's Law Dictionary, the two witness rule, our two affidavits overcome the police officer. Would that also overcome a form of enforcement thing? It'll overcome anything that, that, you know, when you apply the witnesses to it, let me give you another for instance. In Texas, we have a, a bystander's bill of exceptions. The way this works, you're in court, stuff happens, the court reporter's taking it all down, right? And before the transcript comes out to you or any of us, the judge looks at it. Okay? And the judge says to the court reporter, take out this, add that, change this. Right? Right. And if those who have been around long enough know that this happens, <coughs> that that transcript gets modified, and that's against the law, but it happens. And the clerk doesn't like doing it, but the clerk's bread is buttered by that judge, okay? So this is the way it goes, and they present to you a transcript that's been changed, tampered with. tampered with. But in Texas, a bystander's bill of exceptions, three affidavits, overrules the court reporter. Can I ask a question? If I go into the courtroom and carry an illegal tape recorder and tape the entire episode in the courtroom and I get the transcript and it doesn't verify with what I've recorded, can I bring my tape recording forward and say, look, I illegally taped that proceeding. You could probably throw me in jail for it, but they brought forth falsified. The judge had the clerk falsify the record here. Who's the crook here, me or them? Well, before you go to admitting anything like that, I would say, I accidentally <laughs> recorded this. <laughs> <laughs> so the recording would work against them? Well, the thing is, this is what I was explaining with Dwight's case. Um, I, Dwight had me bring the court, had me bring the recording of the telephone conversation with Werner. And they didn't have any problem with the fact that it was a tape recording of a telephone conversation. And I was going to testify to it that this was me on the tape, this is the words that happened, that the tape was held completely secure, it had not gone to anybody else's hands, and was exactly the tape recording that I made. So you've got to have a chain of custody. And I said, it's always been in my custody, and I'm the one on the tape, and I can verify that this is my recording of my conversation with Werner. And I was there to do that, and there was nobody had a problem with the issue of the tape. Jerry Buckmeyer stopped me because of the issue of the oath. But that goofy guy, um, you know, they ended up having to apologize at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I was going to say, before doing that, you need to take the transcript to the court reporter and give her the opportunity to correct it first. I had that done to me twice. Um, there was one time it was a traffic case. The judge tried like nine different times to get me across the bar. I wouldn't. When I got the CD back, it only had it maybe twice in the beginning. And there were other parts of it cut out. And there was another case that I got, another transcript that I got. There were three things that I needed for appeal. All three of those things were gone. Of course. So that was what I was told to do, was let the court, give the court reporter a chance to correct it first, because they sign under penalty of perjury when they do those transcripts. Right. So do that first, and then go to the next step. But then you don't catch them in the act. One other suggestion. I know that in Susie's trial, you had people who were witnesses to that trial. They sat through there every moment the trial was going on. There's, I know at least three or four myself that were, that were in that right. courtroom. You may invite them down to your house play the tape. and uh, play the tape and refresh their memory. 
then they and can have them do their affidavits. They took shorthand every day. Well, have them check their notes and do their check affidavits. Their notes and the transcript. And if they're a little bit sketchy, then just have them to share your favorite music on the radio. Take that. Don't, don't admit to the tape. Were there things different or just missing? The uh, best suggestion I've heard is just to um, is just to hire your own recorder. Yeah, five hundred bucks. Hire your own recorder, rather. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's very costly. A lot of judges won't allow you to bring your own recorder into the office. Because it could be the judge too up front, because they control when it's being recorded or not. And this actually could have been the judge's own doings versus the court reporter. Yeah, he has hold of the button. So he may have actually taken me off the record wow. different times. You know, they try to prevent, actually, she, they try to prevent me from bringing a recorder into the building, but I've never once heard a judge say to the audience, if you got a tape recorder, turn it off. I've never heard that. Oh, be careful. Federal court, it's a crime. Is it oh, crime? yes. I found oh, out. <laughs> he found out. I got lucky. But you know that they do have now it's a spy shop. And you can get a recorder in a pen. And a watch. And, and or a watch. <laughs> Either one. We recorded the entire trial. You can get them on cell phones too. And uh, <laughs> the judge found out about it off the internet because we went to the Richard Cornforce meeting and Richard said, everybody ought to see his watch. And they put that up on the internet and the judge heard it. And the next time I was in that courtroom, I had to come up <laughs> and talk to the judge. And lucky I didn't get in jail for contempt. That's what he would have done. So, it's not, not anything to fool with. <clears throat> well, um, some of the people are already leaving. I guess... Um, habeas corpus. Habeas corpus. Um, what else to tell you about that? I could send you a sample. Make a note. Uh, make a note. Yeah. Make a note. Send it's like a whole file. <laughs> Send it, <everybody>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be easier for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one I'll send you is of where I made a, a change in the style that I was doing things. You know, normally I did the habeas corpus, you have to say some stuff up front, it's important stuff. You have to declare what the case number is, the, the party, uh, what the issue was, uh, so on and so forth, what, you know, uh, and how long they've been incarcerated, where they're currently incarcerated, um, because the habeas corpus is directed against the holder of the key, which could be, you know, to the cell, uh, which could be the chief of police if it's a city jail, could be the sheriff if it's a county jail, could be the warden if it's a prison, could be um, uh, whoever is with the Bureau of Prisons, uh, the warden, or, or it could be U.S. Marshals, you know. But whoever it is that holds the key, the habeas corpus is directed against them. And there's there's a couple of different styles. If if it's the prisoner himself doing it, it's ex parte, and if it's somebody else, it's ex rel. You know, for the people of the state, uh, on behalf of, and then name the prisoner. Would Would you have a habeas corpus already written at time of allocution? Should allocution uh, be denied? And moving forward with sentencing and if you calling. Got time, if you got time, you can do it in advance. Yeah. Um. Anyway, the the change that I made with Nicole's with the habeas corpus for Nicole is I put in a section that I call preview, and I've never seen this, anybody else do this, but I put in preview, and I hit them boom, 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 right away in, in bold print. And like I mentioned earlier, things that scare them are embarrassment and liability. So when they looked at this preview, that's what they saw. And like I say, it arrived in the clerk's desk at 1.05 p.m., and by 5 p.m. she was on the street and she said they didn't even want to let her finish her meal and there was no hearing and there wasn't, there wasn't any exchange of documents. They took one look at that and she was out. <laughs> Go ahead. My question.
question is, when they arrest you and they are shipping you from one state to the next, how do you handle that in, re in reference to the habeas corpus? Okay, first thing is that the process you're talking about is extradition. And all extradition is, is a, a federal matter as such, um, and there's a case, and I'll have to mark that down to the case laws. Uh, was it Bozeman versus Alabama? I can't recall. But anyway, the, they have a limitation, they have a time limitation on them. And typically people just give up and and allow themselves to be extradited. But you can fight extradition and um, prevent them from, from taking you. And if they don't take the right actions fast enough, you can beat the whole rap. They got, uh, this, this case talks about their time limitations to do the extradition. And, and it's, it's a federal matter. And so, um, you know, you might have a state issue, like say you're here in Arizona, but they want to, to extradite you to Pennsylvania. You may be facing something serious in Pennsylvania, and if you could stay in Arizona long enough, they will not be able to take you. So, um, you could fight extradition, um, you, you could do a habeas corpus in that fight, um, you can do all these things. And uh, I know of, of one fellow, he spent 276 days in jail, and they were, best I can tell, way beyond the limit. But he had just become aware of the stuff, his, the limitations. And I think the limit is 120 days, if I recall. Anyway, the day came, they just let him out and let him go. The jailers came to him and said, you're out of here. He was gone. And the other state, kiss off. <laughs> no. Habeas corpus. Um, you want me to share one more little story about habeas corpus? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the mother and the aunt came and shared with me that Ron Gradle had been harassed continuously by the police, and in his past he had been a drinker, etc. DWI stuff. But they shared with me that he had completely given up drinking, but the police had not given up harassing him. And so they had him in the Tarrant County Jail, that's Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, that uh, they were prosecuting him for DWI, and he was looking to get 25 to life. And they said, he doesn't drink anymore, but it's just harassment. And I said, okay. So we did up the habeas corpus, and I went there with the mother and the aunt. And when I arrived at that courtroom where his case was in that court, but this was not a hearing for him. I was just arriving out of the blue with the mother and the aunt. And the place was packed. I mean, we're talking standing room only in the audience area. Scads of attorneys running back and forth lots of police officers, the jury box is filled with attorneys that are waiting to do their thing. And so I went to the communion rail and I started to open it. Well, the bailiff is on me immediately. And, and he says, 
you can't come in here. And, uh, and I said, well, I need to get this to the judge. And uh, he said, okay, well, I'll take it to the judge. So he takes the copy of the habeas corpus to the judge. The judge looks at it, looks at me, looks at this. He gives it back to the bailiff and says something to him. Bailiff comes back to me and uh, the, uh, the bailiff says, you're not an attorney, you have no right to do this, and you need to go home, or whatever, something to that effect. You know, and he said, get, get yourself an attorney. And uh, so I leave the courtroom, and the way these courtrooms are set up, there's a clerk's area beside the every courtroom. So I go to the clerk's area, and the clerk comes to the counter, and I had, the uh, Texas criminal codes with me. And um, so I opened it to uh, uh, chapter 11, which is the habeas corpus. And uh, I turned it around for the clerk to see. And I said, see this here? It says that anyone can present a petition for habeas corpus. I said, that guy on the bench in the next room doesn't know the law. He's incompetent. Who's his boss? <laughs> and the clerk is terrified. And it was like deer in the headlights. And all the other clerks gathered around. And I said, that guy is incompetent. He is working against the law and so on and so forth. I want him removed from the bench. And, and I said, I want this habeas corpus filed. And they were like terrified. And <clears throat> I still wasn't making headway with them. So I went to the elevator and I went up to another area. And there was a judge that I'd been in this courtroom before. And the bailiff tried to block me. I got past the, the bailiff. And I got the habeas corpus into the judge's hands. And this one wasn't the same as others, okay? And he said, Mr. Fox, he says, I know that you have a heart as big as Texas. And you like to help everybody. He said, but you could get yourself into some real trouble with this. I didn't want to confront him with, you know, well, you're a dumbass and, you know, and the law book says anyone can present the baby's corpus. And the mother and the aunt, I mean, they don't know when they were distraught. And so I went back to the original clerks and raised hell with them again. Still, uh, it was still a problem. And, um, but they did, they did take the, the document and uh, we went home and it would appear that um, nothing was going to happen. So I, I did up some other stuff and uh, sent it to, to Ron in the jail. You know, I believe it was a, to disqualify the judge for gross incompetence and criminal act, you know, obstruction of justice and all that stuff. And uh, uh, Ron gets this stuff from me, and he's sitting there in the bunk, and he's also got something from the court. And he doesn't know exactly what to do because the thing from the court is setting a date and time for the habeas corpus. <laughs> and so he went ahead and sent this thing in anyway, which was just a ferocious attack on the judge. Date and time comes up, the mother and the aunt, we go to the courthouse. So we approach the, the courtroom door and it's locked. And the bailiff is standing in the hallway and the bailiff says, are you here for the habeas corpus hearing? And we said, yes. 
and the bailiff said, there ain't gonna be a habeas corpus hearing. That case is dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they looked at between the habeas corpus and the other stuff about criminal acts and the part yeah. of the judge, it was like, we don't want to talk about this anymore. That's it. That's enough. You know, because because the law book said what it said, which I could present to habeas corpus from the beginning. And this idiot had told me, kiss off and get an attorney. <clears throat> How long before the hearing was set from the date that you gave him that? It was pretty quick. It was pretty quick. I don't recall exactly, but I don't think it was anything much more than a week. It might have been two or three days. <clears throat> Probably about three days, I think. Okay, um, so with the habeas corpus, you said anyone can do one. So to get it notarized, I can notarize it with my name on it for someone else, right? Right. Okay. What about... Well, who's, who's making the application of for it? Pardon me? Okay. She would, I mean, she, she does She would for her son. Affidavit. Yeah, for my son. No. Okay, well, your son is in jail. Yes. Prison. But, prison, but, yeah, prison. Uh, he has to, if, either you're doing the habeas corpus or he's doing it. Which is it? We done it together. I gave him stuff to study, and I sent him a copy of yours. Remember, I called and asked you if I could send the copy. Right. So he looked at yours. I sent him a, um, a, a uni uniform commercial codes book and different things that he could study. And so then he put things in, and then basically, mostly I was typing and and co coaching him along through doing it so that it would be pretty much his work. So then I have a copy of him writing out what he wanted in there, and then I've, I've typed it up and prepared it. And uh, when I went to a notary before with an affidavit, they said that to notarize it, it could not be his name, even though I have power of attorney to handle all of his business. So I wasn't certain about um, if I can sign my name and be okay with that being power of attorney or can i sign if it's his your name? name if it's your name is the habeas corpus has to be styled with xrel uh you on behalf of the state uh for with my name at the top instead of his like the state my name yes instead of his see name the habeas state. corpus this is a, for those who are new to this thing habeas corpus in a criminal case is actually civil. The habeas corpus is civil. It can be injected into a criminal case. And when it, when it is, the, it reverses the parties because um, in Pennsylvania, where is he in prison? He's in Pekin, Illinois. Illinois. Okay, so he's in prison in Illinois, and it would be state of Illinois versus our guy, okay? That's the way his criminal case is running. When it comes to the habeas corpus, it's <coughs> XREL, if it's her or anyone else, XREL on behalf of the state of Illinois for him versus the, the uh, warden and and it's like a reversal so he's up here as the plaintiff and the state is down here as the defendant and, and that is a powerful change in terms of status and what's going on here so what uh, fine make sure I understand you. If I'm doing it X-Rail, it's me versus Pekin, Illinois, or it's him versus Pekin, Illinois, and then me, X-Rail, is somewhere at the bottom. Okay. You see how you set them up like this? It's always this and that, this versus that. Um, no. 
I can show you exactly, probably with the stuff I've got in the computer after after when this ends here. Um, we'll do that. And if I can't find it in the computer here, I can either write it out for you or send it to you. One or the other. Send to me too. Of course, make a note of it. <laughs> Just send hey, everything. Send the whole bit. <laughs> send everything. <laughs> Listen, if you were sentenced to read the whole thing, <laughs> you wouldn't have a smile on your face. <laughs>
Okay, um, my question is, if you have a, a trustee sale coming up, uh, let's say in less than a week, how would you handle that? Is it foreclosure? <coughs> They need a trust may also not be valid. The last one that I saw, there was an, acknowledg an, an acknowledgement with it. Um, actually, there was, but it was dated before the deed was even made, so it's, it's void. By law, they cannot foreclose. They have no document. They have no deed of trust to foreclose with until after 10 years. Um, the notary defect, or the acknowledgement defect, has to be corrected. Um, if it's not, they can proceed after a 10-year period. It will be deemed as if it was um, okay all along. But with this particular deed of trust, they, they have to have a deed of trust to, to foreclose with. But it has to be acknowledged. There are certain things that it has to have, and if it doesn't have it, they have no deed of trust to foreclose with. Anyway, there's there's a lot you can do. They have, they have the deed of trust there when they foreclose. Well... They said it's supposed to happen, right? Well, yeah. So saying. you gotta bring it up. Right. You can also uh, do the agency power of attorney thing. Get that. But right. I would start with the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, or okay. just the basic um, elements of the notice and how they have to notice you. There's a lot with that. I'll talk to you after if you want. Okay. Tape has eight minutes left maximum, so. So, well. Um, if there's no more questions at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Carly, you never leave the anyway, um, one quick thing. A magistrate judge. Is that an attorney? Well, he'll be an attorney, all right. Okay, so if he does not have his bar number on here, this is an invalid search work? Is that what you're oh, on the indictments, um, that would be the case. Like that this is a search warrant. You don't want to get that far. This is, uh, yeah, you don't want to get as far as an indictment. Yeah, we, uh, you understand that process. But what I need to do is, is send maybe you or everybody stuff on, on the, the letter to send to the U.S. Attorney. Yeah, I would like that too. Yeah. 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 I got an extra note bad here. <laughs> 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 
good team here. No. No. <laughs> so before you guys leave, um, it's been suggested that if you want to uh, get a set of DVDs, you may want to check with Susie so she makes a note of that. And uh, make a note of that. All right, real quick question. Assistant of counsel, does that give us the permission to speak if I was of That's going to depend on the judge. Typically, they'll say no, but uh, I was in a situation with a woman who was, I think, around 78 years old, and she was like shaking, and she turned to me and she said, Robert, can you help me? And I stood up and said to the judge, the woman's 78 years old, she, said, she could have a heart attack over this thing. She's so stressed out she can't function judge. But I'm familiar with the matter. Would it be okay if I helped her out? And the judge said, very well, Mr. Ponce, you can help out. And then I launched such an attack on the attorney that it made it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like joking to you. <laughs> 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 Did we get a copy of that too? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I was going to say, you know, if you want to stay and talk to people or whatever, but we're going to shut down the tape. Yeah. We only have four minutes left, so okay. can, we can adjourn the meeting and did everyone enjoy? In. Did everyone enjoy the thing? Yes. Okay. I want to say something. You are a wonderful bunch of people. I've been thanking uh, uh, Susie and Ron for inviting me out here, and and I think we've we've made some connections here that, that uh, hopefully we'll be in touch for years to come and always be friends. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for uh, coming out and open an invitation in my home for you, along with your Texas computer. What about you? <laughs> Conditional acceptance. And I would be glad. I'd be glad to work with you for a week or so to uh, maybe get this stuff to a point where it's a little bit easier for you to present it. Yeah. And uh, maybe uh, slide presentations or powerpoints or whatever you want in order to uh, make this. Uh, Successful. You know, I want to keep in touch with you too, Mike. Thank you. So, yeah, appreciate it. One last question. <clears throat> what does your wife think of all this? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> my wife he is uh, cruel. She is cruel. <laughs> my wife left because she thought she felt that she'd be killed when they come to murder me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not kidding about that. We understand. That's a my tough life. My wife thinks the same thing. <laughs> I can't get mine to leave. Well, start a lawsuit against the government. <laughs> <laughs>